Well, Madam President, <laughs> lovely to have you with us. Indeed, the first woman elected president of Ireland, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights, but that's not the end, the UN Envoy to the Great Lakes, which are that group of countries in Africa and a major peace-building mission, so the first UN mediator in a peacekeeping mission, the UN Envoy for Climate, and as the football discussion was taking place, Mary leaned over to me <laughs> and she said, well, you know, I'm the chair of the Global Center for Human Rights in Sport. <laughs> And I said, of course you are. <laughs> but she's an extraordinary woman of achievement, achievements that have benefited all humankind. Um, and I've been wondering, Mary, uh, I've been sort of following you for a long time, and did the young Mary Robinson aspire to a career in public life? Well, the first aspiration that I recall having was I wanted to be an astronomer and study the heavenly bodies. That was when I was five, and I got <laughs> terribly teased by my brothers. I hated the fact that I'd said that, because they teased me uh, unmercifully. Uh, but I never, no, I, I came from a family that wasn't in public life. They, I was the daughter of two medical doctors, and I had these four brothers, two older and two younger than me, so hence my strong interest in human rights and gender and use, using my elbows. And Any of us with siblings <laughs> understands. So you have, since those early years and frustrations with your siblings, um, become a model for leadership, for leadership in general, but for, particularly for women's leadership. And I, I wonder, why, why does women's leadership matter? Uh, certainly, we all know to deprive uh, a woman uh, and of her bringing her contributions, her, whether her talents, her experiences, her perspectives uh, to any endeavor matters greatly. But we have a lot of men in this audience, which is terrific. Why does it matter to men? Why does it matter to society in general? I think in particular because women tend, when they get into positions of leadership, to be problem solvers, to be less hierarchical, to be more collaborative, to think that it's more important that the problem is solved than that I get all the credit, willingness to share some credit. And a lot of men also lead like that now, but uh, I also think that women are more conscious of criticizing themselves in the way they do it. Uh, I, I'm aware when I'm with a group of women leaders, very often we spend a lot of time saying, you know, I shouldn't have done that, I should have done that better. You, you're nodding, you yes, understand. There's a, there's a real willingness to critique the way of leading because we haven't always assumed. And, you know, we still joke about the fact that young men assume they have all the qualities for whatever job it is. Young women say, do you think I'd be able to do that? Exactly. You know, very different. And the, the thinking I'm able to, maybe I'm able to, means that you can critique afterwards and probably do the job better. So we're here at the Bloomberg Equality Summit. You have been a powerful voice for equality, for gender equality. And yet, if you look at the record, uh, the gender gap exists in every country, the gap between men and women um, and their uh, progress on education or in economic participation, political participation. Uh, the World Economic Forum says that the gap uh, for women in the economy, the economic gap, will take 100 years to close at the rate we're going. We've been talking about equal pay. They claim at the rate that we're making progress in equal pay, it will take 200 years. And yet, this is a conference in many ways buttressed by data and all those data points that are evidence-based. And we have lots and lots of data about women's economic participation, political participation, peace-building participation with outcomes that the world critically needs. And yet, what is it going to take to accelerate this progress? Well, that's, in a way, 
what I'm interested in. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> I mean, we have a huge issue that has been known about for quite some time, and yet we have not moved in the way we need to, and that is the existential threat of climate change. I know you've had Patricia um, uh, Scotland, the um, Secretary General of uh, the Commonwealth, speaking, and I know, because I know Patricia, she will have been speaking about climate change. Uh, we have to think differently, and that's really why I kind of wanted to participate in this conversation, to really think about where we are on climate change. Um, I participated, um, as Milan said, as the special envoy of the Secretary General on climate change. Michael Bloomberg was the special envoy on cities, and indeed still is, but I was on climate change. And Ban Ki-moon told me to actually do it the climate justice way, which really was looking after those who are most affected by climate change, small island states, least developed countries, indigenous peoples. And I was delighted to have that focus. And I noted two big frameworks being agreed in, in um, 2015. The first was in September, and negotiated the 2030 agenda with its 17 sustainable development goals. And I try, whenever possible, to wear this pin. First of all, because it's the only UN pin I've ever liked, so <laughs> good, good reason to wear it. But also, um, that's a very important part of the way forward. And the rest of it was the Paris Climate Agreement. And the only reason we got that language about the goal in the, in the Paris Climate Agreement, that we have to stay well below, below two degrees and work for 1.5 degrees, was because Tony de Brum, in particular, for the Marshall Islands, and all of the presidents and prime ministers of small island states were pleading for 1.5 to be in the text. And then, last October, we had the report of the scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which told us that actually 1.5 is the only safe world. We have to stay at that because in between 1.5 and 2 degrees, very bad things happen. The coral reefs pretty well completely disappear. The Arctic ice disappears and the permafrost begins to melt very rapidly and increase the emissions and bring us into blowback territory, which the scientists don't want to go into, for obvious reasons. So the safe world for the whole world, not just for small island states, is at 1.5. And then the scientists said it's doable, but this is what it means. We have to reduce carbon emissions by 45% over the next 11 years. They said 12 years, but that was last October. It's now 11 years to 2030. And we're, and we're in May of that 11 years. So that, to me, is something that requires women's leadership in particular, but actually a bottom-up pressure, a climate justice movement of pressure to convince the delegates who negotiated the 2030 agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement, these are no longer voluntary or almost voluntary. These are imperative. We have to implement them. And that's what I'm really interested in. So to do that, um, we need a sense of global solidarity. We need um, a sense of what we owe each other. We need political will. Would a revolution of women, perhaps, begin to contribute to that in a significant way? I think there's a bubbling up going on. That's all I can describe it as. We see the school children, Greta Thunberg. Um, she helped greatly the message about climate justice because she and the millions of children now who are using their Fridays for Future to come out of school because they're not being protected and saying to the adult world, you need to do more because we don't have a future. We can't do it at the moment. We're asking you and we're coming out of school. The, the injustice, the intergenerational injustice has mainstreamed the injustice of climate change in a way I really like. I mean, I really think we owe it to those children that they've understood and made it a justice issue and made it a human rights and justice issue, as well as an issue of that biodiversity and ecosystems. That's one piece of it. Young people, the Extinction Rebellion, who are prepared to go to jail, but also women's leadership. When I'm with African women now, and you'd feel the same, uh, Milan, because you know them very well, climate change is top of their agenda, not quite far down. Unfortunately, in Europe and the United States, it's a world of Me Too, um, the talk about women's leadership is a bit like you were talking about, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get the equal pay? And, it's, and then we talk about education and health, and somewhere 
quite far down the list is climate change. That has to change completely. This has to be top of the agenda, because if we don't get this right, nothing else is going to matter, and we're not going to have a livable world within the lifetime of young people and within the absolute lifetime of children of young people and, and their grandchildren and my grandchildren. I mean, um, it, it is strange that as a human species, we've got ourselves into this ridiculous mess because we avoided dealing with this issue. We've known and known and known. Yes, there are deniers, and I've called deniers, I don't mean people who are ignorant of climate change, because I've met you know, women in Africa who say, is God punishing us? Because they don't know what's happening. But the denial we're talking about is the deliberate ob obfuscation, the deliberate denial at the high political level, at the fossil fuel level, um, and I call that now malign and even evil. I mean, I'm calling it out at this stage because it's too serious and we really have to know what we're doing and what we're, uh, the world we're living in and, and where we need to go. You know, Mary, um, we often read, and it's rightly the case, that women are among the most vulnerable absolutely. to climate changes in the world, and that's yep. absolutely true. Uh, they are on the front lines of the consequences in many ways. Uh, whether it's agriculture and the lo mm. loss of livelihood or whether it's the disappearance mm. of natural resources, et cetera. But we don't talk to them, talk about them as the solution makers, mm. as important to the solution. Yeah, and that's what this book, I, I have to hold my book up, um, on climate justice. This is a storybook. There are 11 stories in the book. Nine of them are about women who are fighting back exactly as you said didn't know what was affecting, completely changing their circumstances so that they didn't know how to put food on the table, didn't know when to sow, didn't know when to harvest, had to go further for water, had to go further for firewood. And um, uh, so nine of the stories are about women. There are also two good men um, in the book. But I'm trying to bring home through storytelling the reality that we don't appreciate enough in parts of the world that are still benefiting from a kind of temporal climate. Um, somebody said to me the other day, maybe the way to explain the problem is to sort of think about us all being in a high-rise building. We're up in a penthouse at the top of this high building, but down below it's already on fire. And as we throw our garbage down, we accelerate the fire. But we're at the top, so we know what's, you know, we should know what's going to happen. Um, you know, we need to have these images somehow to bring home to us that we may not be feeling it as much as, for example, Mozambique. Um, uh, Grasa Michelle is a fellow elder. I'm now chair of the elders. I was with her um, actually in Abidjan recently at a Mo Ibrahim Foundation meeting, and she spoke about having come from Bera in her country, Mozambique, a city of three million people, wiped. She, she said, you know, it, it was extraordinary. Everything was gone. The houses were gone, the place was flooded, there was no insurance, no FEMA, no, um, you know, nothing to fall back on, no plan B. And uh, she was watching her desperate fellow citizens, and she kind of said to me, this is the first time I've really fully understood just how serious climate change is. And that, you know, was from a woman who's very accomplished and very aware. It, it takes a first-hand witness sometimes to bring home um, just how serious it is. But it's not just women leaders and young people and Extinction Rebellion and the rest of it. It's also business leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been very impressed by the business leaders, um, the, we, the B team that I'm very linked with uh, as an elder, um, you know, Paul Polman and uh, Richard Branson, etc., who in January of 2015 in, da in Davos, and I was there, said that in their corporations and their supply chain, they would commit to being net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and do it the climate justice way with just transition. Nobody else was saying that. Christiana Figueres was delighted because it meant a lot to her in her role as executive secretary of the uh, UNFCCC at the time. Now, I'm glad to say more businesses, the whole of We Mean Business is committing to be net zero. We're seeing corporations calling on governments to be more ambitious. We're seeing cities being more ambitious. We're seeing states in the United States, despite the bad federal leadership, saying we want to move ahead. And that's what I mean about the bubbling up. There's a real awareness. And what we need is that this impacts. Um, I understand that um, 
Uh, I don't know whether the Parliament here has passed a resolution here in Britain. Certainly the Parliament in Ireland recently passed a resolution. I'm a bit cynical about that because Ireland is not so good on climate. I mean, we, we, our, our Prime Minister, our Taoiseach, described us as some part of a laggard on climate change <laughs> in the European Parliament last year, and we are. Um, because we have lobbies that influence, we have a big agricultural sector that's important to the economy, and we haven't really until recently. But it's changing. I can see it every day, the government taking much more seriously. So we have time, it is doable, and I think women's leadership is going to be absolutely crucial in just pushing this forward as an absolute priority. And what does it mean? It means we have to change from the total consumption that drives economies, production, consumption, 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 Black Fridays, go and buy, buy, buy. No, we've got to move to um, more quality. Um, you know, we're talking about fashion taking on the issue. We're talking about um, food and getting rid of food waste. A whole behavior change. Who changes behavior? Women. And I'm, um, I do this podcast, as you know, because um, we've, we've podcasted together, um, uh, called Mothers of Invention. Um, and our byline is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And I, I, I explain it. I do it with a young Irish woman called Maeve Higgins, who's a very successful comedian in New York. She was eight years old when I was elected president, and she's half respectful, which makes it very funny. And she is a very funny comedian. But um, I, I explain that man-made is generic. So both women and men contributed. Men contributed more because they had more power to, to the damage of the greenhouse gas emissions, but we're all responsible. And a feminist solution definitely includes as many men as possible. And a feminist solution tackles patriarchy, tackles a capitalist system that has lost the social contract dimension that gave it legitimacy. That's a rampant um, so, um, capitalism that leads to the kind of gross inequality that we see in our world today. All of this is going to have to change if we're going to, first of all, get out of fossil fuel by 2050 completely um, and do it by 45% by 2030. That means we really have to change our ways. And I believe women's leadership is, is going to be very key on this. And if I may, Milan, I know I'm hugging the show here. No, but that's, your, that's your ball. <laughs> but I say to audiences now, whenever I have a captain captive audience, and you're a captive audience just for the next few minutes, I say three things. First of all, everyone, everyone has to take climate change seriously, personally, in their lives. And that means you've got to do something you weren't doing before. I give an example, I've become a pescatarian. I've given up all meat. I actually love lamb from the west of Ireland, I'm still in withdrawal, but no, I'm not going to cheat, that's me. And when you've done something, you know, be more efficient about energy, recycle more carefully, whatever it is, then say, okay, I'm doing my bit. And then the second thing is get angry and get active. The get angry is get angry with those who have more power and who are not doing enough. Governments at all levels, including in cities, and then industry, particularly fossil fuel, agriculture, particularly agribusiness, transport, etc. And then get active in supporting those who are fighting for biodiversity, for conservation, who are voices for climate action, for climate justice. Support them. And then the, th the third thing, and believe it or not, I think now this third thing is the most important because it's the one we're not really doing enough about. And this is where culture and art and cultural institutions come in. We have to imagine this world that we want to actually get to in a hurry. I hear so many people say, you know, climate is so terrible and we'll have, an, we'll have no life, you know, because we'll have no car, we'll have, that's nonsense. We will have a much healthier world because we won't have the air pollution, we won't have the water pollution. We'll have a much fairer world because it means we'll have clean energy for all, which is what the 2030 agenda has committed to. And that means that the billion people who never switch the switch for electricity will have the gadgets that exist now, the clean lights, the the, the units, the solar panels, etc., and the 2.3 billion who still cook on dirty cooking will have the clean cook stoves now moonshot in the next five or ten years because we have to. And that will change, I think, our relationships. And we will have to do what I grew up learning to do, which is to mend, to reuse, to hand down clothes, 
to value the things you have rather than throw away in a throwaway way. So women are so vital to this. And I, I saw an example last November in the architectural biennale in Venice. I was asked to go along for the closing of it in November because it was being curated by two friends of mine, two Irish architects who act as Grafton architects. They're brilliant women. They're very practical, Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara. They had chosen the earth is our client and asked architects to respond to that. And this gave me a real sense of the future the future of mobility, the future of living together, the future of um, buildings. Even in a Bangladesh project that I remember of disused saris that had been gathered in for high fashion because the material was still good. They had been just discarded, but they could be used as high fashion. And, and all kinds of imaginative ideas. You know, uh, just listening to you talk about the integrative nature of addressing climate in everything that we do, and I think one of the problems has been uh, that it is a very complex topic. We read about emission standards and carbon taxes and carbon dioxide levels that are rising by the moment. And it seems that as an individual, what can I really do about that? Uh, and I think that's been part of what's kept mm. large numbers of people who say, look, I'm not a scientist. Mm. I'm not an expert. Mm. Uh, what can I really do? Mm. Well. As I say, I recommend the three things. Make it personal, get both angry and active, and imagine and think about this world, which will be a much better world. The world we live in at the moment is a very divided, populist, angry, disjointed, um, not a great world from the point of view of the values that we really should have. But if you read the 2030 Agenda, it's full of solidarity. It's full of language of leave no one behind, prioritize the furthest behind first. That was in 2015. That's not so long ago. We kind of, we're in a bumpy time. We can go back to that framework of the 2030 agenda and its 17 sustainable goals, deliberately 17 because it is complex. And we have to think about oceans, and we have to think about biodiversity, we have to think about um, production and consumption. And you know, all of that is in the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Paris Agreement now has been interpreted in a very stark way of warning us. We have 11 years in which to reduce by 45% our carbon emissions, which went up last year. And we've just seen the highest 415.28 um, <coughs> or something parts per million of carbon, the, the highest carbon in the world for three million years. And when we were there before, none of us were there, but when the world was there, um, the sea level rise uh, levels were far higher. So, um, you know, I'm not talking, um, um, you know, in a, uh, out of evidence. I'm, I'm basing what I'm saying on what the scientists are telling us and what the evidence is. And we need um, to now get the political will. I've just read a book um, about how we knew for so long. It's called Losing Earth by Seb Sebastian Rich, I think was his name. No, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Rich. And it's all about that we knew, and it was all about Tim Worth and Al Gore and the hearings in Congress and all the rest. It was very American-oriented. But it was all about we knew the science for so long, and it was mostly men at that time who were acting on it. Um, luckily now, we have a lot of women. We have Christiana Figueres, we have um, um, Lawrence Tubiana, we have you know, a lot of women leaders who have been leading on um, climate. And I think, um, you know, it's not that we take over, but we certainly have to make our concerns about the fact that we haven't got a safe world for our children and grandchildren. That's the bottom line. It's, it's certainly the bottom line. And, and you're talking about uh, clean cook stoves. I don't know, I'm sure so many people in this room travel uh, in, in the societies, particularly in the South, where the only way women, and it's always the women, cook is over these dirty cook stoves. And that spews black carbon into the air. If you go into any of those settings, you start coughing, your eyes burn, but you're not really conscious of what is the cause of all of this. And it wouldn't take that much uh, to make a concerted effort mm. to move from those dirty cook stoves to clean yeah. cook stoves. There are a lot of governments, uh, I NGOs, and others involved. That's the alliance of clean cook stoves. Indeed. But it, it's, it's not. It, you know, it's getting at hundreds of thousands, 
We're talking right. about 2.3 billion. Right. It needs a moonshot approach. It needs what Kennedy did when he put a man on the moon. It has to be a but priority. But it's also raising consciousness, and yeah. I think that's what you've done here mm. today, uh, is to raise our consciousness, to tell us all, we all have a role in this. The situation is dire. It gets more alarming by the moment. But we have to have hope. And we have to have hope always. <laughs> um, so thank you, Mary Robinson, for always leading the way. Uh, always getting out ahead, uh, but really caring deeply about why this matters. Uh, so please thank her.